Hello, everybody. Welcome to Talk About House. I'm Todd. I'm Juana. Okay, so today we're going to talk about an article for, uh, that, uh, from the Fannie Mae CEO, quoted a bunch of times in it. Um, title of the article, Housing Today is a Tale of Two Markets, and we need to make it work for everyone. Really quick, we have a lot of problems with sort of this idea that it's somehow going to work for everyone, but um, well, let's just start with the basic thing. Fannie Mae, what is Fannie Mae's mission? Well, apparently it thinks that its mission is to turn everybody into Bo Derek into a perfect 10. Oh, perfect 10. Okay. It <laughs> um, thought people won't get the reference. What, yes. Who's Bo Derek and what's a perfect 10? Yes. It was the 80s movie. Okay. What but, does Fannie Mae do? Like okay, what's so, their like right. their purpose? Right. So Fannie Mae is purpose is to, um, is to help with, it's to help um, engender home ownership both through uh, marketing and through programs that allow more people to participate in home ownership, which is a good thing. Uh, you know, I just object the word everyone, uh, but that's just me. <laughs> and it's not that I'm trying to be, to not be inclusive, but it's everybody is not cut out to do the same things and not everyone has the same priorities. So that's the word, that's why the word everyone rubs me a little bit. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll go through some stuff in the article here. Um, and then, uh, we'll talk about what, what's going on with real estate, help you get a better perspective for why things are doing what they're doing. Okay, housing today is a tale of two markets. On one hand, it's a good market for homeowners. Mm -hmm. Fannie Mae's latest home price index shows that prices have jumped by 5% this year so far. Now remember, in a normal year, they only go up by like 4.8 or 4.9. They've already gone up 5% this year. It's a three-year trend of historic growth. Uh, more, this means more equity wealth for homeowners. Mm -hmm. So this is a good thing as far as um, the, the balance sheet of most homeowners, right? Because they, their equity, their wealth is growing on paper. Remember, this is on paper. Uh, this is only for entertainment purposes. It's not uh, necessarily real wealth because until you actually turn that equity into uh, money you can use, it's just, it's just wealth on paper. So that, that's a good thing. The other good thing is that, of course, a lot of homeowners are in a good position because they've got uh, these fantastic interest rates and uh, affordable payments, which is really important. And of course, there's 42% of the population or the of the homes out there that are owned free and clear, and that provides a lot of support for housing. So all of these put together are a good thing for sellers because there, there's a lot of price support. Now, the, the other half of the tail is is if you're a home buyer. Okay, let me read the next quote. At the same time, it's a tough market for home buyers facing rising home prices and mortgage rates that have more than doubled over the past 18 months. One, 18 months ago, home prices were five to 10% less than they are now. Mm -hmm. Less, they've gone up right. in the last 18 months. What? Tell me about, we were told that as soon as mortgage rates go up, the prices would drop to counteract that. But that's opposites happen. Interest rates and up home prices have gone up. Right. So this is just uh, very strict market economics, supply and demand, right? We've talked about this all year. Yeah. And so that's what's driving home prices. And then, of course, not only do we have low supply, higher demand than we have supply, but we also are do not foresee supply increasing, which puts added pressure uh, as far as uh, pricing is concerned, for pricing to be at the very least stable, if not increasing. So because we don't see inventory growing in the future, we don't see sellers rushing to sell before more inventory comes to market and uh, they stand the possibility of having more competition. Um, here, we're going to go through some bunch of bullet points. Home prices continue to be driven by fundamental forces, supply and demand, not speculation or the sort of sloppy underwriting that led to the Great Recession in 2008. Well, that's very, um, very blunt about the sloppy underwriting part. I kind of like that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. There was no underwriting. Literally, all you had to say was, oh, yeah, I want to buy five houses. I make 400000 a year. And they'd be like, oh, perfect. Here's enough money to buy five houses. And then you would see, oh, I've got five houses. I'll just put them back on the market for 50000 more and see you know, if anyone will buy them. Right. So that is no longer the case. Now we have well-qualified buyers. That means that these are buyers that have uh, good credit scores, good credit history. They, have, they are able to prove their income. 
they're able to prove um, things like bank statements and tax records and things like that. So those are all good things that make for well-qualified buyers and well-qualified buyers are much less likely to uh, get in trouble with their loans, to default or be in any sort of distress. So that's a good thing. That again provides stability to the market and it does it puts people in a position where they uh, are able to weather whatever happens to values and to uh, not have to fire sale that their home. Uh, here's a quote, and then I'll make a comment after it. Thanks to strong underwriting standards, the vast majority of today's mortgages are safe, solid, and sustainable. Okay, a couple things. We have the lowest number of not only foreclosures, but 90-day late mortgage payments that we've literally ever had. Right, but okay, so that that's a combination of a number of things, okay. right? So we've kind of talked about that before. So that's a combination of uh, people having affordable mortgage payments because they have low interest rates. Okay. It's a combination of a strong job market, so unemployment is very low. Uh, it's a combination of also the banks that have learned their lesson. And when a borrower is experiencing difficulties and that borrower contacts the servicer, that servicer works with the borrower. So those 90-day lates do not show up because they do some sort of a workout plan where maybe they get um, a, a, an abatement on the payments for a few months or they get reduced payments or some sort of arrangements are made to keep that borrower in the home and keep that loan in good standing. Now, if you're think, sitting there thinking, well, yeah, but at some point, you know, the, you know, the, the chickens will have to come home to roost, right? At some point, this borrower is going to run out of options and this borrower is going to be in trouble. And I don't dispute that. There will be some who will be in that position. However, as Todd mentioned, uh, borrowers have a lot of equity because they were well qualified to begin with. They put down at least 10% down, if not 20% down. Uh, home prices have gone up. So even with all of that, you know, what you end up with is a borrower that still has equity. So what we ran into in the Great Recession is that people owed more on their houses than what the houses were worth, and borrowers today are not in that position. So a borrower who has a house that is worth more then what is owed on it is in a good position. Yeah, and um, this goes sort of with the next uh, quote here, uh, next bullet point. Price gains on existing homes are strengthening homeowners' balance sheets. Mm -hmm. So here's a good example. The average person puts down 20% when they buy a house. That's if they're getting a loan. 42% mm -hmm. of all homes are free and clear. About a third of new purchases are all cash. You know, if you just bought a house for 500000 and you put... 100,000 down, 20% and got a loan for 400. And you wake up the next day and the home prices were 45. You're not going to just run out and say, oh, I'm not making the mortgage payment. Well, then you're going to lose the, because you only owe 400. Because now you're going to lose all the, the whole 100,000 you put down is gone. You're not going to get that back. So nobody's running out there dumping their house. Here's the other thing. If you bought a 500,000 three years ago and you have a 3% interest rate, you know, you have four hundred thousand dollar loan. Your pro your payment's probably sixteen hundred bucks, and you cannot rent that house. That house probably is three thousand dollars to rent that half a million dollar house or more, depending on what market you're in. Okay, so you're not. There's no way you're going to give up that payment. Here's this interesting thing. I think this is the interesting thing. Even if home prices start to fall, which they're not, they're going up. They've been going up for basically fifteen years. No one's going to get rid of their low payment. You, who You don't care what the house is worth on paper. Like Wanda said, it's paper. It's just a number on paper. It's like fantasy land equity. It doesn't mean anything to you sell it. If, if I gave you a house and said it's a million dollar house and you have a monthly a dollar monthly payment and I called you a year later and said your house is worth eight fifty, you would say, oh, I lost $150,000 of equity. I'm going to sell the house. And well, I'm not going to get anything. But I'm just going to sell the house. Well, then you lose that dollar a month payment. Mm -hmm. That's an absurd example, but it is one of the reasons why nobody, if you own the house free and clear, you have no payment. Right. And the other thing is, I'll give you this other example too. I think maybe that that's the next quote. Okay, um, I'm going to give you this next quote before I tell you the, my next thing because the next one I think is fun. This will give you perspective, okay? The portion of the existing housing stock for sale is at historic lows. Mm -hmm. Baby boomers are aging in place. Home buyers who close mortgage or homeowners 
who refinanced below 3% during COVID are staying put rather than relocating taking out a, and taking out a 7% loan. If you got in a time machine, went back to 1995 and said, I'm going to buy me a bunch of houses because they're super cheap. And you went out and started to buy houses and you said, hey, I want to buy some houses and I want to get a 3% loan. They'd be like, yeah, knock it. They're, they don't exist. You say, okay, 4% loan. No. Well, what about 7% loan? Because that's what we pay in the future in 2023. They'd be like, no, there's no 7% loans. We haven't had interest rates under 7% in over 30 years. That's what they'd say. In 1995, we haven't had 7% interest rates for loans in over 30 years. You know, 1990, the mid-90s interest rates were probably 8 9% still, right? Yeah, it's about right. Okay. So this idea that 7% is like untenable to the housing market is ridiculous because, you know, that we're yes, it's the highest it's been in the last few years, but historically that's not an unreasonable amount, especially when you get a money market for four or five percent. Mm -hmm. It's just a couple percent above the risk free rate, which is where mortgage rates come from. It's basically the cost of money with a two you know, two percent, two and a half percent premium for the lender to take some risk and loan it out on a home loan. Right. Yep. Yeah, so what do you think about that, Wanda? The You've got these people who are not giving up their house. <laughs> there are other people looking at the housing market going, this is a really safe bet. Like, I think housing is a better bet than U.S. Treasuries. I think the federal government would default on the debt before you're going to lose a ton of money in real estate. Well, so I'm not putting a bet on um, the federal government one way or another. Um, but, you know, I agree with you that, you know, real estate makes sense. It makes sense for a lot of reasons that we've talked about before, right? First of all, everybody needs some place to live. Uh, and, you know, whether you own the house or you are renting the house to someone who needs to live there, either way, everybody needs somewhere to live. And then as far as interest rates are concerned, uh, you know, kind of to your point, people who have low interest rates are going to be very... Um, very weary of giving those up because those are low payments and this is an opportunity for them to build wealth, right? So uh, they can earn money, they can save money, they can um, get income in other ways and buy their next home in other ways while still maintaining this property and uh, going ahead and pocketing the difference between their payment and uh, the amount of rent that, that they receive and, you know, earn earn equity in, in the homes, both through the payments and through appreciation. This is such a rare opportunity. You know, I want you to think of it this way. Think about, you know, the late, you know, like 2008, for example. Well, I'll just pick that year. Uh, 2008, 2009, you could buy houses for next to nothing, right? And, you know, if you could go back to that time and buy a whole bunch of houses, of course you would, right? Because you know what the deal is. But it's kind of the same thing with these low payments and these low interest rates. This is also a once in a lifetime opportunity. This is not going to come along again. And most people recognize that. And most people recognize that this may be their only opportunity to have an investment property. An investment property is just that. It's a property that uh, is going to provide you with a source of income. It's going to uh, grow in value and provide for you later on in life. And you know, most people have never had a rental property, but right now it's a unique opportunity for so many people to have a rental property, to have an investment property, something tangible, not something that you see on your, um, on your E-Trade account, right? Or in your 401k. It's a very tangible asset. And I think that's very meaningful. I think that's very important. And I don't think most people are going to let go of it. Now, some of these accidental landlords, will they have a bad experience being a landlord? Absolutely. Will some of them throw their hands up and go, you know what, I, I understand what you're saying, but it's not for me. Absolutely. And those people will sell and that's fine. But I think that most people are more tenacious than that. Most people recognize a once in a lifetime opportunity and most people will choose to keep their investment for the long term and reap the benefits. Um Here's a quote, and then I'm gonna we'll do we'll wrap it up. Prices have continued upward, and affordability, which is comparing median household income to median home prices, is also near historic lows. So we have low affordability, but high home prices. 
I want to just kind of throw this out here. We're not saying you should run out and buy a house. We've never said that. Okay. If you remember what home prices were in 2005 and six, they were peaking, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They did a poll. They do this ever. I think it's a monthly poll. It's, do you think buying, it's a good time to buy a house? The highest ever recorded ever in the history of that poll. Ready for this? Mm -hmm. Was November of 2005. Mm -hmm. Home prices had gone at 50% in the US. It's the best time to ever buy a house. It was like 80 something percent of people, the highest ever. Okay? Mm -hmm. Guess what? The lowest ever was. The lowest, lowest ever time to buy, like worst time ever to buy a house. Uh, 2011. 2011. <laughs> it was like June or July of 2011. We have videos on this blog where we say the housing market's turned the corner. It's gonna, it's just appreciation from here on out. It, the worst time ever in history to have bought a house, according to people who were polled, was June of 2011. So people, the common wisdom, thought that the 2005 when prices were super high was the best time to buy, and 2011, because they'd just been beat up on housing. Housing, they just hated housing. That it had nothing to do with if they thought, like, why would you say it was a great time to buy when prices just went up 50%? Because people are lemmings. And then when prices have completely tanked and are lower, you know, at historic lows, adjusted for inflation, they were the lowest they'd been since the 50s. And people could have gone out and bought houses in Vegas for 40, 50 grand. Like house, detached homes, 40, 50,000 bucks. You could have got eight, $900 a month rent out of them. Uh, those are unheard of numbers, by the way. You get like 18 to 20% cap rate on a single family rental. Uh, houses today are easily probably worth about you know close to 300,000, most mm -hmm. of those houses. Yeah. Um, so whatever, you know, right now people are super negative, right? 20% of people think it's a good time to buy a house. 80% don't think it's a good time to buy a house. So our opinion is that there is no good time or bad time. There is only a good time for you or not a good time for you because every situation is different and everything that you hear out there is designed to um, get you emotionally involved so that you stay and you either click or you uh, watch the commercials or whatever it is because you are the product uh, you know you, you're being sold so you know kind of keep that in mind we're not selling you anything we don't care what you guys do we just care that we give you good information so you can make choices that are right for you um, you know, I mean, I know plenty of people that are buying houses right now uh, or that have just bought houses, obviously. Well, this, uh, this is what we do for a living. Obviously, we have the lowest inventory we've ever had. Mm -hmm. So you know what that means? It means there's more people buying than selling. Right. So what do those people, are they completely idiotic? And a lot of them are paying cash. Like, what do they know? So. What, and yes, a person that makes 35000 a year cannot run out in you know, San Diego, California, and go buy a house. Right. So, you know, everybody's market is different. Every situation is different. But what makes sense is to consider that real estate is a long game. Uh, appreciation is over the long term. And that homeowners who have those great mortgage payments, uh, a lot of them will choose to become real estate investors, if, even if that's their only real estate investment outside of their primary residence. Yeah. Okay. So what do you think? What's going on in your market? Tell us where you're watching from and what's going on. Uh, you don't have to agree with us. We just appreciate you participating in the comments. Please remember to like the video, subscribe, hit the notification bell, share the video, and we'll see you on the next video. Bye. Bye.